Thank you for coming. This is a particularly lovely audience. I'm Lawrence Cohen, the director, and I'm uh, delighted that Abhishek Kaku is speaking today. He is, of course, assistant professor, and I'll be brief, of history at Berkeley. Before coming uh, to Berkeley, he held the prestigious junior fellowship at Harvard Society of Fellows. He trained uh, with uh, notable historians at Columbia University for his PhD, <laughs> um, producing a dissertation with the title, Shades of Sukhita Mehta, of Unquiet City, Making and Unmaking Politics in Mughal India, 1707 to 1739. He received his MPhil from Columbia and MA from UBC, uh, with a master's thesis beautifully titled The Colonial Entombment of the Mughal Habitus, Delhi in the 18th and 19th centuries, and he did his BA in both history and in classics from McAllister uh, College. And all I'll say is that his influence is quite noticeable because in, in being a creature of this tragic age and Googling him uh, <laughs> this morning, one of the first things you find is many, many scholars across disciplines and areas of research in their acknowledgments thanking him for profoundly changing how they think. And it was a tremendous acknowledgement and it's a tremendous delight to have him at Berkeley. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction, Florence. Uh, and thank you all for coming on this, uh, what I know is a busy time of semester and a busy evening. And thank you to everybody in the department here for uh, letting me present what is very fresh work. So thanks, Manali, especially. Um, but thank you for giving me the opportunity to present what is uh, work that I must confess is in a vein that is new for me. Um, and so what I present to you, which while for purposes of completeness will have the semblance of an argument, is very much work in formation. And I'd be very grateful for any comments you do have to offer about it. Um, so without further preamble, let me begin. Um, in seeking to communicate the value of Mughal poetry to an audience in Madras soon after the partition and independence of India in 1947, the distinguished critic Hadi Hassan, uh, who lived between 1896 and 1963, turned repeatedly to the glittering metaphors of gemology. The much reduced corpus of extant Mughal poetry, he said, quote, comprised of gems of thought which were, quote, more effulgent than stellar and lunar and solar light. Defending this poetry against the modern criticism of its supposedly excessive ornamentation, Hassan conceded that, quote, there are few emeralds without flaw, but he insisted that, quote, even flawless emeralds were produced by Mughal India. All this rhetorical effort was expended in the service of the duty, quote, to Islamic culture to show that the most precious jewels of the great Mughals were other than emeralds or diamonds. So lavishing praise on the many hued refractions of these gems of speech Hassan exemplified the tendency to appraise the vast corpus of Mughal poetry through the jeweler's loop. Such attitudes reproduce the traditions of textual interpretation and appreciation championed by Mughal poets of the 17th and 18th centuries. Like their peers in the Ottoman and Safavid realms, Mughal poets produced formal volumes of poetry, divans, and collated anthologies, tazkiras, that praised the works of their peers and ancestors in the language of the appraisal of Jews, Johar Shinasi. In doing so, they esteemed particular poetic forms, such as the Ghazal, um, as the most refined expression of abstract sentiment, a position of privilege that it retains to the present day. And of course, everybody who has any encounter with South Asian culture has encountered the Ghazal in one form or another. But the language of Mughal appreciation uh, invoked and in fact reproduced by Hadi Hassan and others has emphasized the purely aesthetic aspects of Mughal poetry while occluding the social and political effects of poetic practice in the pre-modern world. Though they gesture to its significance, <coughs> historians of early modern South Asia have similarly had little to say about the place of poetry in the society and politics of the Mughal Empire. But the use value of Mughal poetry is far greater than that of the diamonds with which Hadi Hassan compared it. For, as we will see, it is still possible to discern the frozen sediments of social and political dynamism beneath the polished iridescence of Mughal poetry. Yet it is not the case that the realities of the Mughal 18th century are simply reflected 
in the poetry of the period, as historians have commonly assumed. And I think it is important to build on Paul Lozensky's work here, which highlights how Persian poets produced poetry and scribally publicated it for sale to audiences across the Persian-speaking world, in which the social practice of poetry for Lozensky had, quote, diffused to religious institutions, coffee shops, merchant homes, and craftsmen's shops. So in a related vein, this paper argues that the practice of poetry was in a sense integral to the practice of politics, and particularly elite politics in the late empire. As a side note, I should add that while my monograph in preparation explores the relations and significance of both elite and popular politics and poetry, in this talk, I restrict myself to the realm of elite politics and poetics alone. So, despite their insistence on the aesthetic nature of their enterprise, Mughal poets routinely produced poetry as a commodity of material value for exchange in the marketplace of the political. I will make this argument today through the microhistorical examination of the life of the now forgotten scholar and poet Abdul Jalil Bilgrami, uh, born 1660, died 1725. The objects of my inquiry today are two poems produced in 1714 or 15 by Abdul Jalil, both concerned with the emperor, Farrukhsiyar, who reigned from 1713 to 19. Uh, and both poems were reproduced by his grandson and biographer, the famed literary scholar, Ghulam Hussain Azad Bilgrami. For the purposes of this talk, I treat both poems, one merely four lines long, the other stretching to some 1,400 verses, as political speech acts. But where the first poem, a portrait, succeeded spectacularly, the second poem, a long and celebratory description of the emperor's wedding in 1715, can only be regarded as a failed elocution. And this is what I will seek to show in my talk today. So the conditions of this success and failure, as far as I'm concerned today, illuminate a hitherto obscured but defining feature of the late Mughal world, the centrality of making poetry in the work of doing politics. In conclusion, I will say a few words about the nature of Mughal politics as it emerges uh, from the study of this poetry, time permitting. So our story begins on a winter evening in 1731 on the dusty frontier town of Bukur in Sindh. And here's a map of the northern part of the Mughal Empire. Here's the capital in Delhi. And there is Bukur in Sindh on the water. Um, and here's an image of the 18th century, of uh, Bukur in the 19th century. So you can trust me. It's was dusty, even if it's less dusty today, with <laughs> irrigation. So, on this winter evening, a 26-year-old junior official by the name of Azad Bilgrami is beginning to pen the colophon to a little notebook in which he has for the past some days been collating a long poem by his grandfather, Abdul Jalil Bilgrami. And here, almost three centuries later, I would encounter this notebook in an archive. Why did Azad collate his grandfather's poem? In the colophon here, he conforms to the familiar formula, asking only that, quote, spectators, expert in appraising jewels, so the same language that Hadi Hassan would use several hundred years later, may remember both author and compiler in their blessings. But these pages were copied and recopied with some rapidity as they traversed the subcontinent's literary circles. One archive, almost 900 miles away, holds four copies made between 1748 and 1787 alone. And the poem was printed in 1882 and 1886. Um, it seems to have fallen out of fashion, decisively fallen out of fashion, shortly thereafter. So why did Azad decide to put his grandfather's poem in circulation? Or rather, why did Abdul Jalil not distribute his crowning achievement in his own lifetime? In his long biographical entry in Abdul Jalil, written much later, Azad offers a curious response. The poem, he said, did not pass before the emperor's gaze because of the, quote, impediments of the era, Mubani evoked. Because the emperor was imminently to adorn the throne of the eternal kingdom, continued Azad, Abdul Jalil did not set his heart to preparing a fair copy, and then himself died shortly thereafter. So it was only after his death that Azad himself prepared this fair copy and produced a marginal commentary on the more obscure verses to the best of his ability. 
Now, this is a frankly disingenuous explanation because the Emperor Farrukh Siyar, who was married on December 17, 1715, was overthrown and executed by the Sayyids of Barha. One of them is present in this image of Farrukh Siyar some three and a half years later on the 29th of April, 1719. And Abdul Jalil himself died much later uh, in 1725. So, to what end were Azad's elaborate manipulations of this seemingly insignificant chronology? We might consider this question in terms of an elocutionary failure produced in the moment of the composition of a very substantial epithalamium that nevertheless was impossible to circulate as intended. The failure of this poetic speech act, attributed to the impediments of the era, indicates the operation of a certain form of power that literati like Azad were loath to acknowledge. This failure, as we shall see, reveals a world in which the practices of the composition, circulation, and consumption of even highly aestheticized courtly forms of poetry were directly political acts. So how did Abdul Jalil come to write, but never publish the poem for which he would be posthumously known? The answer to that question also lay in Sindh, where 15 years ago, Abdul Jalil had held the same office of news reporter that Azad would go on to hold. And the answer involves a short poem, no more than four lines long, scribbled in the margins of the usual news report that Abdul Jalil was tasked to send via imperial courier to Delhi. There had been strange news recently, precisely of the sort that Abdul Jalil was expected to report. He had heard that sugar had rained down in a freak storm in a nearby village. So Abdul Jalil wrote on the margins of the news report, uh, unfortunately, um, my formatting seems to be a little bit off on this computer, but the poem is to the effect, Farrukhsiyar and Shahanshah Babakat Chakas Adabeu Shuda Shirin Harkat the Sin Zameen Ehde Ishrat Mahadesh, Barid Sahab Rizai Kandonabad, which I translate as, and these are all very provisional translations, so I know there are many experts in this room, please feel free to correct me um, as you encounter any mistakes I might make here. But I translate this as, Farukhsiyar, the emperor manifoldly blessed, whose grace brings the heavens so sweetly into motion, that in the, very, that in the land of sin and his delight filled rain, the very clouds pour down sugar and candy in rain. We can only speculate what caused the dutiful minor functionary to throw caution, to throw caution and caution and custom to the winds in producing such a cloying bureaucratic irregularity. Perhaps Abdul Jalil, tired of his isolated existence on the frontier, recall the picture of Bakr, <laughs> um, had performed an act of poetic insurrection against the numbing monotony of a dead-end job. Perhaps this was a last-ditch attempt by a neglected, aging intellectual to have his talents rightfully appraised and be rescued from sin's arid oblivion. If this is indeed the case, it was not regarded kindly by Mir Jumla, the senior most administrator in Delhi responsible for monitoring the imperial news reports. When Mir Jumla saw this dispatch, he did not order the investigation that Abdul Jalil would have hoped would be his ticket out of Bakr. Instead, disapproving of this upstart official, Mir Jumla had him summarily removed from office in the early days of 1714. So Abdul Jalil arrived in Delhi in July 1714 after an arduous four-month journey seeking new employment. He described his arrival in the city as, quote, having fallen into the Red Sea, and what follows I cite a series of the letters that he writes to his son, um, a collection that was pointed out to me by Professor Rifan Habib, for which I thank him. Um, so he er describes this arrival as having fallen into the Red Sea, and he notes that he suffers enormous expenses at every turn without an income to sustain him. He fell ill with fever and dysentery, uh, recounting 60 or 70 evacuations of blood and phlegm in a three-day period. It was too expensive to rent a mansion, so Abdul Jalil was forced to suffer the odium of living in an inn in a katra, the katra of Sheikh Farid, with only a single servant to wait on him. And Abdul Jalil described the environment in Delhi in bleak terms. All the long-standing traditions of the reign have been upset, he said, and all business is halted, save for those who have much money. And even they spend great amounts and suffer great losses, and so humiliate themselves 
and depart. Meanwhile, the common folk are entrapped in circumstances described by the Quranic verse that, quote, whoever is in the heavens and the earth will swoon away, except those God please. So why were affairs at court so troubled? These affairs were disrupted by painful and protracted struggle for power between two sets of noblemen, the upstart Sayyids of Barha, who had led Faroqsiyar to the throne, and a more venerable group of noblemen of Central Asian extraction, including Mir Jumla, who cautioned the emperor against the power the Sayyids had accrued to themselves. And here's a picture uh, said to be that of one of the Sayyids of Barha, Hussein Ali Khan, I believe. And you can see that he is uh, represented with a sort of slightly darker complexion attributed to people who come from Hindustan, as opposed to the lighter skinned <coughs> interlocutor with whom he's clearly having some sort of a tense meeting. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, we might as well imagine that this other person is Mir Jumla. Um, so it was under these conditions that Abdul Jalil was introduced to the levy of one of the two Sayyid brothers, the high official Hussein Ali Khan. From the letter to his son, it is clear that Abdul Jalil prepared for this encounter with care. He wrote a quatrain of felicitation for Hussein Ali Khan, which was to be recited at the Amir's gathering, but because of the Ramzan fasts, the opportunity never arose. Abdul Jalil continued to attend these gatherings and finally managed to slip a few verses to the great man on the occasion of Eid. This time, the great man did read Abdul Jalil's paper and smilingly complimented him on his composition, going so far as to gesture him to sit with his own hand. To his son, Abdul Jalil described both the importance of this meeting and his frustration with it. <coughs> he, that is Hussain Ali Khan, is currently so powerful that they say that if he accords with someone, he makes him flourish. As for me, I would like there to be a direct benefit. For else, what is the value of verbal kindness? But all these affairs also produce benefits on the condition that divine grace accompanies one. So it is no doubt the uselessness of verbal kindness that also propelled Abdul Jalil to seek out the chief administrator in the establishment of Mir Jumla. This was despite the fact that Mir Jumla was responsible for removing Abdul Jalil and was an inveterate opponent of Hussein Ali Khan. No meeting took place with Mir Jumla, though Abdul Jalil noted with chagrin that others who arrived at his employment uh, immediately received jobs on very generous terms. Battling his recurrent sickness, Abdul Jalil struggled pitifully with obstinate bureaucrats in the Imperial Financial Office to receive a minor increment uh, in his rank at court. It was under these circumstances of tension between the two great noblemen that Abdul Jalil finally found his opening. In a letter to his son, he describes it in the following manner. Mir Jumla's chief secretary produced a new appointment for Abdul Jalil in Bijapur, apologizing for the fact that this was in the Deccan, far in the south, far from home. I was hesitating over accepting this offer, wrote our author, when it came to me that if I might get a similar appointment from the offices of Hossein Ali Khan in Hindustan, it would suffice. With this intention, Abdul Jalil began to attend the uh, levies of Hussein Ali Khan again. And then, quote, a long quotation follows, one day, this mendicant's quatrain, which had been composed in Bhakkar and enclosed in the news report, and which had not been examined carefully by Mir Jumla, and so not sent to His Highness, came up for discussion. Shoaib Khan, a certain Shoaib Khan, said to his lordship that so-and-so has produced a good quatrain, and it is worth hearing. His lordship turned towards this mendicant. I read out the quatrain and related the whole event. His lordship approved greatly of the verse, and it was in his hand when he adjourned the assembly. End quote. Matters progressed rapidly from here on. Hussein Ali Khan carried the verses to his brother, the vizier, on the same day. The vizier produced it before the emperor, pointedly noting that these verses of praise for the emperor had their author relieved of his job. The emperor was astonished and said of his own accord that Abdul Jalil was to be restored his job. And the next day, when Abdul Jalil went to wait on his newfound patron, he learned that his former services had been restored. I had not sought the renewal of my position, he writes, strangely, quote, but I must accept my fate. I think we can be confident that it was not, or not only, the abstract and impersonal forces of fate 
which propelled Abdul Jalil bin Rami to the attention of the Sayyids of Barha. There were, as we have seen, powerful motivations which led Abdul Jalil to wait on both of the two competing nobles, Mir Jumla and Hussein Ali Khan. It is clear that Hussein Ali Khan and his brother, the vizier, used the little poem that Abdul Jalil had written in Sindh as ammunition against Mir Jumla before the emperor. In doing so, they obliquely demonstrated their loyalty to the throne, while suggesting that Mir Jumla sought to punish those who expressed such sentiments for the ruler. But it is also clear that Abdul Jalil himself provided this ammunition to Hussein Ali Khan. This act of participation was firmly in keeping with the spirit of Abdul Jalil's daring inclusion of a poem on the margins of a news report in the first place. It granted him, albeit after strenuous effort, a certain proximity to the Hussein Ali Khan um, and a channel of access to the Emperor Farooq Siyar. And doubtless it is this access which Abdul Jalil hoped to use to present his poem on the Emperor's wedding as a means of securing even greater favors that were not, as he had put it, merely verbal. So now we turn to the second poem. Now, where Abdul Jalil's courting was ultimately, if contingently successful, his long poem on the wedding of Farooq Siyar failed as an act of elocution. This poem, about 1400 couplets in length, describes and praises the marriage of the Emperor Farooq Siyar to the daughter of the ruler of Jodhpur, Raja Ajit Singh. Yet this was not an unambiguously happy event for all parties concerned. The wedding marked the submission of Ajit Singh to the imperial throne, negotiated with force and diplomacy by Abdul Jalil's patron, Hussein Ali Khan, the bride to be arrived in August 1715. About four years later, when Ajit Singh joined Hussein Ali Khan in overthrowing the emperor, the Rajput princess returned to her natal home. These are the turbulent straits in which Abdul Jalil's poem foundered. But why should such a failure even be a possibility in a long poem devoted to the spectacle of a wedding? And what was the point in writing it? In what follows, I identify three sources of tension within a poem otherwise devoted to describing illuminations and fireworks, rituals and feasts, singers and dancers, musicians, jugglers, and comedians. Abdul Jalil begins with lavish praise of the emperor himself, focusing, however, on one attribute, his generosity. Our author seeks his generosity, albeit in highly financialized form. So he writes the couplet, When the emperor inscribes the notation of generosity, its extent prolongs into the notation of a grant. And this is the sort of long line that you draw to, make, to write a grant. He moves on to an idealized description of the qualities of the ruler. As an ideal emperor, Farooq Siyar exercises his intelligence to ensure that justice, the most important condition of a society, is widely dispersed. All rest and motion in his action are aware of prudent policy in the affairs of the people. Abdul Jalil draws on his understanding of the humoral body to represent the emperor as a doctor who ministers to a humoral body politic. This is a notion already embedded in the identity between Dr. Hakim and ruler Hakim. <coughs> the tending of justice for Abdul Jalil is essential for balance and order in the social body. But Tibbiadl chu sazad madawa ze zulmayad birun ikhlate soda. When he effects a cure through the medicine of justice, Tyranny expels its black bile. What is the meaning of justice? It requires the protection of the weak against the depredations of the strong. Jabali khislat in shai ghazi, adalat parvari, ajiz nawazi. This monarch and holy warrior innately fosters justice and cherishes the weak. Now, as an ideal ruler, Farooq Siyar is naturally cast as a protector of Islam. His sword empowers the form of Islam. His rule extends over both Rome and Syria. Uh, if his wrath turns towards the infidels of old, the evil of infidelity is thrown into disarray. This sets the tone for the coming conflict with Ajit Singh, which is the first source of trouble for Abdul Jalil. So he has a long set of poems, which I want, a long set of lines which I want translate in full, I'll simply read them out uh, in English. 
And he writes, the leader of the great Rajas of Hind, whose territory extends all the way to Sin, the finest of the family in the Rathor lineage, which is exalted above all others in the era, due to his excessive daring in rule, he dominates over all other equals. Maharaja Ajit are the words of his name, which finishes with the word Singh. He is the commander of Marwar, for the tip of his lance slays serpents. And there's a nice play of words here, Marwar and Marwar, uh, serpent slaying. To suppress him was raised suddenly the emerald green of the imperial sword. Now, Abdul Jalil treads a delicate path here. He must describe the act of rebellion, which led to the arrival of the Raja's daughter in Delhi. At the same time, he can hardly criticize or demean the emperor's father-in-law. This is all the more true because of the circumstances of the marriage which Abdul Jalil celebrates. He describes the dispatch of an imperial army to subdue the recalcitrant Raja, and this leads almost naturally to an opportunity to reflect on the virtues of the army's commander, Sayyid Hussein Ali Khan, who also happens to be his patron at court. So he writes a long poem which says, the commander of the victorious army, the nobleman master of the blood-spilling sword, the son of God's prophet in both worlds, the apple of the eye of the commander of the faithful. He belongs to a family without peer, and he goes on in this vein. He exalts Hussein Ali Khan in the warmest terms. And now, as you see here, the language takes on a markedly Shi'i tone. So he says, Be jang nusrat afrinast, nishaniyaz amir al mu'mininast, nitanha, Right? So he contrives victory in war because he's the memory of Hussein and Ali, and because he's a product of both Imams, both Hussein and Ali, his name, Hussein and Ali, is connected with both their names. This is strikingly sectarian language in a poem ostensibly designed for consumption at the imperial court. At this junction, it is worth noting that Abdul Jalil's prose essay on his first visit to Aurangzeb's court in 1699, written some 15 years before this poem, expressed full-throated approval and affiliation with Aurangzeb's particular brand of Sunni orthopraxy, one that suppressed infidel celebrations like Holi just as it did heretical displays of mourning in Muharram. And Abdul Jalil explicitly praises those actions. So his intemperate praise and his emphasis on connecting Sayyid Hussein Ali Khan with Hussein and Ali might sit uneasily at a court that still retained its identity as a bastion of a broadly inclusive, but nevertheless Sunni Islam. Having lavished this perhaps unseemly praise on his patron, Hussein Ali Khan, Abdul Jalil returns to the topic at hand, describing the imperial army on its way to deal with the refractory Raja, who is predicted to be overawed by the might of Mughal arms. And um, Abdul Jalil has great, greatly contemptuous lines for um, Ajit Singh, who he said, represents as saying, he said to himself, who has the power to resist? When Ali comes, who's Ibn Abdevid, who's uh, somebody killed by Ali at the Battle of the Trench? I'm a Hindu who will be split by his sword, for doesn't lightning often fall in the dark, conforming to the old trope that Hindus are dark-faced beloveds, if beloveds at all. Ajit Singh is defeated. Having lost his lands, he is represented as abjectly supplicating the general and the emperor. The result is that Ajit Singh's daughter is sent for marriage to the emperor, and now Abdul Jalil must deal with the emperor's new wife, so he must pivot from his account of the humiliation of Ajit Singh to the modestly covered virtues of his daughter. Farrukhsir, for his part, graciously accepts Raja Ajit Singh's supplication. In the poet's words, he accepted her and granted the Raja mercy. You might say he gave a corpse life again. This is an ironic line considering what Ajit Singh is going to do to Farukhsiar in just a few years. From then on, in regard for the Raja, he gave that flame a place in his guest house. He acquainted that idol with the faith. He cut open the knot in the sacred threat through the king dwelling in victory, was conjoined inner light with her external beauty. So she converts to Islam. Now, we need not concern ourselves with the accuracy of this depiction since many historical sources indicate that such weddings were treated as opportunities by the Mughals to reward, conciliate, and incorporate powerful Rajput's ruling groups. This was particularly true of Farukh wedding, where for the first time ever, an emperor's marriage procession, his Bharat, 
proceeded down the city's Moonlight Avenue to claim his bride uh, from the people who were keeping her. But this was a procession from which the vizier, who was Abdul Jalil's patron's brother, was conspicuously absent. Abdul Jalil, for his part, again appears to have felt compelled to say something on the subject. And this, I think, is the third source of tension that I would like to point to today. After praising the vizier, he says, nobles surrounded the bountiful emperor like youthful stubble in the face of the beloved. Each nobleman, <laughs> together by the shah, were like stars in the procession of the moon, except for the loyal Nawab Qutb al-Mulk. For this reason, in the imperial procession, did not the great nobleman join. On the basis of the imperial order, he was waiting on the queen's needs. But his heart was in the imperial procession. He was at the mihrab, intending to prostrate. These crucial lines should raise the question of who this poem was meant for. In an obvious way, the poem was meant for the emperor. But why then did Abdul Jalil feel compelled to defend the vizier's actions to his own ruler? I think it likely that the poem had another audience in mind. The elites who surrounded the emperor like stars haloed the moon, and who were doubtless speculating about the meaning of the vizier's most prominent absence. Yet we see how unpalatable these lines would be for the ruler to himself here. So, I have identified three sources of tension that I think contributed materially to the failure of Abdul Jalil's magnum opus. These were his inability to find a vocabulary to describe the meaning of Ajit Singh's complex relation with the emperor, his valorization of the Sayyid family in notably Shi'i language in an imperial context that formally maintained a Sunni persona, and finally, his awkward justification of the vizier's absence from a wedding procession, which raises questions of the poem's audience. Was Abdul Jalil writing for the emperor or for his court? This is a question that I'm as unable to answer as Abdul Jalil himself probably was. But it is clear that two impulses, the desire to praise an emperor and the desire to be faithful to one's patron, had diverged from Abdul Jalil. It is a measure of the power and significance of these tensions, I think, that instead of resolving the matter by redacting the poem, he simply chose to let it lie unpublicated until it was resuscitated in different circumstances and to different ends by his grandson. So in conclusion, I think the successes and failures of Abdul Jalil's poetry should demonstrate the centrality of the act of making, circulating, and appraising poetry in the work of doing elite politics. But what then does this poetry tell us about the nature of late Mughal politics itself? In the time remaining to me, let me push on just a little further. Abdul Jalil's quatrain tells us something about the volatility and sensitivity of a political culture in which a seemingly trivial poem could win you wealth or lose you your head. I've also suggested that in a strongly agentive fashion, Abdul Jalil traded the cultural capital of his quatrain for political capital with his patron, Hussein Ali Khan. In doing so, he inserted himself as a participant in however minor a role into the struggle that would precipitate in the public display of the Emperor Farooq Siyar's mutilated corpse outside the bastions of the Red Fort in Delhi. But his unpublished epithelium bears a different message. Scarred by the tensions I have identified in the second part of my talk, Abdul Jalil's poem is unable to express a graceful recognition of the rapidly changing relationship between emperor and nobleman. Why was this the case? By way of an answer, let me suggest that while Abdul Jalil's first literary works are resolutely focused on the imperial court, the emperor who appears in Abdul Jalil's poem is a curiously abstract and impersonal figure. We might contrast this with the famed account of the military officer Mirza Nathan, who about a century before this date had prepared for a suicidal battle on the Bengal frontier by fastening an image of the reigning emperor Jahangir to his turban. Abdul Jalil's concerns expressed vividly in his letters, are not with an emperor. They are rather turned towards the lumbering administrative bureaucracy and the obstreperous bureaucrats who manned it. Now, unlike their Ottoman counterparts, Mughal emperors did not withdraw into seclusion and rule from behind the veil. On the contrary, the visible presence of the emperor's body remained a vital component of the political order. Formally visible, though he may have been, the emperor was no longer a figure of personal significance in the lives of his more humble servants. <clears throat>
So I've argued that Abdul Jalil's poem was silenced by its inability to express the changing realities of the 18th century political order. In attaching himself to Hussein Ali Khan, and in remaining at his side even after his unprecedented deposition of Farooq in 1719, however, Abdul Jalil's actions do betray a sharp understanding of those changing realities. The silences of his epithelium are loud. To not publicate one's greatest literary achievement was to make a strong choice, one that disregarded the theoretical conception of imperial power in favor of an inchoate and inarticulable but nevertheless emergent reality. <coughs> Abdul Jalil's words and deeds did not violate the conventional ideological framework of the Mughal polity. We recall he praises the emperor in the standard, even classical poetic fashion, attributing perfectly stereotyped virtues to him. And in his conduct, he conforms to the usual values of patronage, affiliation, and dependence. But even without personally breaking the rules of the game of Mughal elite politics, he contributed to outcomes that were restructuring that system of politics. The silence of his poem, therefore, should suggest to us one way in which elite politics were transformed and reconfigured in the turbulence of war and regicide, not through moral failure, lassitude, or imperial decline, or through the dramatic events of regicide and riot, but through the many actions, each of which were consistent with the ethos and values of the Mughal world, and yet each of which, through the contingencies of historical events, we're coming to forever transform that world itself. Thank you. So on that rather momentous and wonderful note, the floor is open for questions. Yes, Professor Taha. <laughs> Thank you. That was a that was an extraordinarily capacious talk. Um, that didn't go. That didn't have to go very far um, to to give us a lot to talk about. But I'm wondering about two kinds of language that circulate for you, um, and sort of bookend of the the talk. One is this language of the failed illocutionary act, and the other is the language of exchange value. And while you were speaking, I was trying to understand what their relationship was mm -hmm. to one another. And I wonder, and I'm going to throw this out as a as an option, and you can tell me if this works that when you bring up the, the question of the abstracted emperor, right, that is perhaps where they actually come together, mm -hmm. right? The abstracted emperor in this poem is what makes it both a failed elocution, but also a curiously productive object of exchange, right? It holds a space open inside of this poem for a changing politics to come, mm -hmm. right? It's not that it's prophetic, but it's a way in which um, it retains its use value after the apparent material life of the emperor, mm -hmm. right? So once the life of the poet as an, as an occupation has ended, the, the poem as a speech act retains a particular kind of exchangeability. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder then about the this, your, your insistence that it's a failed elocution. Mm -hmm. And I want to push you on that and ask why you see its failure. Mm -hmm. That is to say, isn't it maybe an elocution that operates belatedly or proleptically, mm -hmm. and not actually as some kind of failure as a, a kind of concrete end. Right. Uh, that's, I, I think um, that's a very good point, and I, I want to emphasize that I see this elocution has two lives. Right? Um, its first life, I think, is a failure, because Abdul Jalil, as I said, you know, is unable to present this work, which is a stark and startling reality. I mean, this is something that should trouble us. What's interesting is that his grandson, and I could say much more about this, um, finds this poem, puts it together, circulates it as a way of solidifying his own lineage and the brand of Bilgram to make it powerful in a different political reality, right? So the political reality that his grandson inhabits is a very different one in which he now lives in the South, has no affiliation to the Mughal court, and is building himself up as a belonging to a family of talented scribal administrators in a very different political session, in which the British, by the way, are also present. So it would seem to me, I think it would be important um, to distinguish between these two senses of the poem and also to remember that this poem doesn't actually exist until it is put together for the second moment, right? So it's that non-existence of its first iteration would be the clearest sign of its failure for me. I do, of course, completely get your point about thinking about it as a belated elocution, and that's something we'll certainly think more about. Thank you. <laughs> 
by the book. So. Yeah, what is your theory of historical change? Yeah. So, but, um, but actually, that's where I'm heading. Yeah. Uh, a lot of things happen in the space between the writing and the circulation of the poem. Nader Shah, you know, regicide, so on and so forth. I mean, uh, all of which you, you, know, you write about in, in the dissertation. But, but the poem was written, uh, you know, clearly with a set of intentions that you, I think, very uh, uh, ingeniously excavated and um, and attempted to uh, explain. And yet, um, there's a there's a moment at which it can't be deployed, right? So, uh, the the question I have, in a sense, is you know how much is it is it because of the a set of events, a set of receptions within the space of its potential circulation that uh, that disrupts the plan, uh, or was the plan itself, in some sense, doomed to failure from the start? Uh, because the, in a way, the you know the, the life of the poem that begins with the uh, with, with its circulation and publication and uh, and, and, and and use uh, in very different times for very different purposes. Uh, in a way, is, is 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 not part of that story. Right. It's a it's a separate story. It's right. A, it's a story after a lot of other things change the political circumstances of of, of, of mobile sovereignty. Uh, leave alone, you know, the positions of princes and lords and bureaucrats and all the other players in, in the empire. So I guess I'm, I'm I, I, although I, I find the you know the, it, it, there's a way in which the story that you're telling highlights the incapacity of this poem to serve its purpose, if not its function, uh, at the time, it doesn't really tell me about the political uh, uh, stakes in some sense that were at play in the contemporaneous uh, mm -hmm. uh, moment before the regicide. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I guess I'm, I'm asking, in a way, a broader question about the relationship of poesy and, and, and politics. Right. Uh, if if you're if you're if you're making an argument that is that is that is in some sense bigger than what you just presented, or at least or do you want to make an argument that is bigger than what you just presented in the sense that uh, that this was uh, an act that could have succeeded, mm -hmm. that was meant to succeed, but that somehow got disrupted in a political uh, set of interactions that tell you something about that period of 1714, 1715, 1716. Mm -hmm. That is to say, without the proleptics of the regicide, mm -hmm. uh, that otherwise we would not know and could not have access to, uh, uh, were it not for the poem. Right. It's a big question. Um, it seems to me that the conditions of the success of the poem in its first iteration would be fairly banal. Right? You would have to remove some lines, rephrase some things, and this would be an act of. Uh, normal poetry of the kind that we would expect, um, that would be unsurprising in many ways, might have been circulated, the poet might have been rewarded, this would be the sort of standard life that one could imagine for it in a sense. But it, this doesn't happen. What does it mean for this to not happen? Is this a feature of the events of 1715, 16, 17, 18? Um, materially, that is the case. Um, what does that, however, tell us about the workings of politics in that very period? Right? And that's, that's a separate question, and that's the question that I've tried to get at. And so, anticipating this question, I did, in fact, try to sneak in a theory of historical change right at the end of my talk. Right? Um, and my theory of historical change is very simple. It says that even when people act uh, with intention, in accordance with the rules of a political order, Right? Whether in writing poetry for a certain purpose, or whether in behaving in certain sorts of fashions, nevertheless, because of contingent circumstances, completely contingent circumstances, their actions can in fact cause to transform the system that generates their action. That, I think, is where I would lay my emphasis uh, on the transformation right? uh, that is produced by the act of writing this poem. This is, I think, what its failure marks for me. Um, I can say more if you'd like. 
is really just a, a, something I missed. Um, he was restored to his position. Yeah. And Hussein al Fadl was his patron. But what was his position? So his position was um, uh, his position was the news writer, the Vakia Navis at Bhakkar. In seven so he had to go back to Bhakkar? No, so what, what the, 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 the future story is actually a very interesting story, yeah, just, in that he never goes back to Bhakkar. Okay. Uh, he transfers, the, uh, he, in, a, in a classically late Mughal political move, he, plan, he transfers his deputyship to a loyal ally in Bhakkar. He receives the income from Bhakkar without actually being there. He sends his son there. His son inherits this position. Mm -hmm. um, and then that position is transferred, presumably, to Azad himself. So the, three this, this, this position becomes a three-generation hereditary position, at mm -hmm. least. Um, events in Sindh, of course, take it out of the imperial orbit very rapidly in the 1730s, so it's not possible anymore. But there's a separate Frank Perlin-esque story of, uh, you know, entering the you know, entering a political system through the mastery of its techniques and then transforming its logic. But that's a that's a that's a separate so story. So at some level, what becomes central to him is maintaining his patrons. Goodwill, right, and that's the whole part of the poem that you read for us. It has right. the, the praise of him, right. Uh, that in a sense, it is more important for him, right, right, to praise Hussein Ali Khan and to be at Hussein Ali Khan's side than it right. is to be at the emperor's side. Exactly. Yeah. So it seemed like it was silly idea to write this poem in the first place. If he knew he couldn't give it to the emperor, right, why did he undertake that task, which was blatantly at odds with his interests. Right. I mean, I think the fact that it was never put together as a poem until Azad puts it together would suggest to me, I mean, I don't have the manuscript that Azad was working with when he put this thing together as a poem. So perhaps he spent a lot of time, I mean, this is 1400 verses, you know, I mean, there are eight lines on fireworks, eight lines on henna, eight lines on horses, so forth, right? Maybe he thought that he would be able to assemble it in some form into a poem. That the emperor could accept. That the emperor could accept, and he never found a way to do that. A way to do that. Yeah. yeah so going back to the quatrain that, that you started with, um, now I guess we know eventually it, it pays off the, pretty much the way he wants it to. But but I'm interested about why Mir Jumla refused it initially, and and, and what. Abdul Jalil could have uh, expected because yeah. I, w I wonder if you could sort of put it in, in a yeah. wider context of circulation sure. of poetry because is the problem that poetry is out of place or is it that it's too flat? Right. Um, it would seem to me that I mean, there can't be anything too flattering in the world of Google. That doesn't, that's not a sort of meaningful right. concept, right? <laughs> um, but I think the poetry was out of place, right? I mean, I think that Mir Jumla was conforming to a standard of bureaucratic administration. So this is an interesting moment in thinking about how the bureaucracy works and is supposed to work, um, and norms of routinization and professionalization that dismiss this kind of behavior or find it deeply unacceptable, a form of bureaucratic adab, right? Um, on the other hand, um, Abdul Jalil does this because he wants to be recognized. He really believes he should be recognized. Um, and I do see this as a sort of last-ditch action. Um, he is in his 50s when he writes this verse. He dies in 10 years, within, within 10 years of writing this, uh, this poem. So, so, you know, go back to that picture of Sindh, um, <coughs> which should tell us something about why he wanted to get away from there. <laughs> Yes. So, uh, thinking about how politics comes out, I wonder if you can think about how poetry functions. Mm. Because, uh, I mean, is this exceptional? Because when, when I think of all the interior poems or, that are being written, not only in Google code, but even in the regional code, yeah. these are commissions. Yeah. So, is there something exceptional about this attempt that you see here to reach out? Is it an 18th century moment, or is, this, yeah. is there a longer history to poetic Social practice, the social practices of poetry yeah. in this particular Yeah, I mean, clearly there's a big, there's a sort of big place <coughs> of the social practice of poetry, right? And I alluded to that at the beginning of my talk. I mean, Paul Lozansky has very nicely demonstrated just the reach of poetic practice and how it trans Farad Hassan for the 18th century tells us that, you know, barbers are writing poetry and there is discomfort around that among elite circles. But, um, I'm not sure that all poetry is commissioned. I mean, I think it is a sort of agentive act, always, right? Um, it's something you have to do. 
um, it probably says something about this kind of politics that that sort of practice of poetry is being transformed, right? So that you can't simply go to court, write a poem, and get money anymore. Um, that's not an obvious answer. What is an obvious answer, and what uh, Abdul Jalil does, is write lots and lots of chronograms for his patron, Hussein Ali Khan. He writes a chronogram, and Hussein Ali Khan builds a canal in Delhi. Abdul Jalil will write a chronogram for that. So he, you know, now he participates in the standard poetic culture of people writing chronograms for other people, whether they're friends or whether for rich people, um, to seek their support, financial support, obviously. Um, so it is sort of grounded in the matrix of that broader practice of social culture, but this is an exceptional act also in a certain kind of way. And we have to remember, this is somebody who's a very lowly official who finds himself catapulted to the highest court uh, in what is an increasingly difficult court to access. Yes? Suppose, um, this might sound naive, but suppose he's writing a chronicle, for yeah. a chronicle for future, for, for posterity. Yeah. But he finds that he doesn't really want to be discovered. And you know, there are cases where people have resorted to poetry or to you know, other art forms in which they leave behind as well. Yeah. yeah. Fine, but they don't want to be is it a quote out? Well, oh, these only people coming about there. Right. And he's not really writing about you. And so, well, is there something of that there? This is another social function of poetry. Yeah, yeah. There is a lot of poetry where uh, you don't want to be caught out as its author. Um, this is not that kind of poetry, though. Right. I mean, this is. If you don't get paid for this, then what's the point, really? Um, you know, if you don't say nice things about this particular emperor, they're, they're, the first four pages are an indexing of his generosity, right? Mm -hmm. Every finger dispenses money. This is the way that Abdul Jalil sees it. Um, so this is, a, this, this is what's troubling about this particular poem, is that you would imagine that he would really want to claim it. Now there are, you know, there's a lot of vulgar satire and pornographic poetry from the 18th century that is of uncertain and doubtful attribution and that circulates in a very different social or cultural orbit. Um, this is, okay. aside from that, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in the topic of your paper because my first book was in fact on panegyric poetry and its relationship to court politics in Russia and, and Europe in precisely the same period that you're working on, which is the 18th century. So this is something I've actually thought about a lot, but in a very somewhat different geographical context. And my question would be about the relationship between political history and genre history, mm -hmm. and specifically literary genre. Uh, at this moment, I mean, in the, in the presentation that you give, which is very rich and, and largely convincing, you attribute dynamism and change largely to questions of historical contingency mm -hmm. and political power, which I find largely convincing. I'm sure that it's largely also true. But at the same time, a couple of things come to mind. Firstly, the relationship between poetry and praise, whether it be of a deity or of a sovereign, is very, very ancient. Mm -hmm. right? It's one of the, in fact, inaugural moments of poetic utterance is the relationship between rhythmical language and praise. So right. it has a long tradition. Um, and specifically, one would have to think about the ways in which particular poetic forms or genres emerge in different literary or linguistic spaces mm -hmm. to facilitate the, the, the question of praise. Um, in the European tradition, it goes back to the Pindaric Ode, mm -hmm. right? and then gets transformed in various moments in European court history, culminating in, in the neoclassical period in the 17th and 18th century. I don't know the tradition in Farsi, but I think that one thing to think about is, first of all, the specific generic matrix of uh, genres of praise, and whether there is an element of there's a specifically literary poetic element as well as a purely poet, a political one mm -hmm. in the in the in, in the question of, of of change and transformation mm -hmm. right? and the relationship between the literary and the political. Uh, so that's one thing I, I would suggest that might be worth thinking about more. That is to say, the relationship between genre history and political history, which is often discontinuous. Mm -hmm. That is to say, largely because genre history points to a centuries-long conversation. Mm -hmm between writers and poets, while, while historical contingency can often be about the convergence of specific alliances of power and so forth which that can dissolve within months or years. Right. Right? So how to think about the long durée of, of, of literature 
and the and the contingencies and immediacies of politics <coughs> is, I think, really for you, perhaps the biggest question to think through. So that one wouldn't simply attribute to politics alone the element of dynamism. Mm -hmm. And the final point I think I want to suggest is that, particularly with genres of praise, um, and, and quoting genres of hate praise, which have which are closely aligned to patronage, it is very tempting to reduce the political mm -hmm. to a purely pragmatic, instrumental use of language in its relationship mm -hmm. to power, mm -hmm. right? And I'm sure in, <laughs> in many of these quotes that was largely what was precisely at stake. So mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that we ignore that element entirely. Right. But it also means that we reduce the political to this purely pragmatic search for favor. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think the relationship between language and power could be understood more richly and complexly. Absolutely. And I'm not suggesting that that's something you don't know. I'm right. sure you do. Yeah. But, but that might be something to explore further. But, or perhaps this writer is particularly insignificant and minor and is not making a major change in the tradition. Mm -hmm. But certainly in, in Europe and Russia at this time, there are some substantial ways of rethinking the very locus of poetic subjectivity with respect to power that I think could be thought through. In other words, a notion of the political beyond the purely pragmatic. Thank you very much. That's a really rich comment and leaves me with a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. I want to offer two quick responses. Mm -hmm. One is that, um, and this is a very preliminary response, just thinking to what you said. One is that, um, this 1400 verse poem is a Masnavi. Um, and I don't know the 17th century context as well as the 18th century context. Munis will be able to tell us more about this. But um, in the 18th century, the genre of the Masnavi mm -hmm. um, is widespread. People are, and the Masnavi is a poetic form that, express, that it, uh, permits long narration, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so this long narrative form seems to be very, very important in the 18th century, mm -hmm. though scholarship has focused on the ghazal, right? And so that was one of my gestures, was to say that we have to look at things other than the ghazal. There is a sort of dynamism <coughs> within the history of the genre mm -hmm. that needs to be recognized. So that was one. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that um, the masnavi is a good form for doing both praise and satire, which are seen as deeply related in this tradition. So that, you know, uh, um, Poets are described as carrying a poem of praise in one hand and a poem of satire, a satire in the other. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on how much you pay them, right? So there's that. <laughs> and and, and so, so, so that's the question of payment. But thirdly, um, not to reduce the political uh, purely to questions of rent seeking, mm -hmm. I think is very important. And I did try to make a gesture towards that in suggesting that there's an entire description of the emperor, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a formulaic description, but it's an important description because it represents a political value that is, in fact, very real. Mm -hmm. The emperor is, in fact, a doctor to the entire body politic. He does, in fact, have all of these roles uh, dictated by the language of Islam or justice or generosity. These are important things. Mm -hmm. But something has changed because he can't really still say that. Mm -hmm. And those, it, that change in condition mm -hmm. is what I'm struggling to work my way towards. So in that sense, I'm really grateful for those comments. Thank you. Munitz, yeah, please. So, um, <clears throat> I'm going to have to come up with another question because Harsha basically asked my okay. question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, it's funny because listening to you talk, uh, Abhishek, I was just trying to think through the context in which this fairly long poem would have been written, right? We're talking a thousand couplets. If you have any sense of time as to how long it would take someone to write this, I'm sure this doesn't, it's not a week, it's not even a month, it's probably, you know, spread over maybe a year, maybe even more than that. Um, so I'd be curious if you have any sense of time as to how long it would have taken him to put together, you know, what, in whatever shape and form, the number of couplets that he has. But, you know, you can just see how, I mean, the dummy is just in a terrible position. Because if you assume that this is a poem that takes, say, a year, a year and a half to write, right, even if he doesn't quite put it together, the situation on the ground is changing so rapidly, mm -hmm. right under his feet. In the end, he doesn't know who he's writing this poem for, whether it's for the, you know, the Bar Sayyids, is it for the emperor, is it for someone else? And so, in a sense, the, the poem is reflective of the confusion of a political context. And this comes back to you know, Nick Dux's uh, yeah. question to some extent. Um, you know, I would 
I would be quite comfortable, and perhaps you can, you can correct me on this, I'd be quite comfortable to say that this is, on some level, a poem that fails just because events on the ground overtake the sky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel very comfortable. I feel very comfortable with that. But assertion. the second thing yeah. is, and it's the point that I would like to ask, uh, you know, what, what do you think about this? I think there's another point of failure over here. Mm. In the sense that it is a poem about a marriage, and it's a marriage between an emperor and a Rajput princess. Mm -hmm. This kind of marriage between an emperor and a, and a Rajput princess has not happened since Akbar's reign. Mm. Am I wrong? Uh, Bahadur Shah's wife is a Rajput princess. But he's right? married to her as a, as a prince, right. not as an emperor. Not as an emperor, that's right. right? Yeah. So you've not had a situation where an emperor is marrying a Rajput princess for, you know, I mean, a very long period, Absolutely. over 120, 130, 140 years. Yeah. Right? Not since the 1580s. Right. Think about the circumstance of that moment in the 1580s right. with an empire that's growing. Right. And then the circumstances of not contracting any more marriages as an emperor. Right. The Mughals have arrived. Right. They don't need to contract marriages. Right. So in a sense, this poem is a case of noblesse oblige. Right. It's a, the problem in this poem is that Belgrami picks the wrong topic right. to kind of highlight. Because it's actually not a moment of, on some level, perhaps joy and celebration and all that stuff. Yeah. But it's actually pointing to the weakness of the Mughal Empire and the Mughal Emperor. Absolutely. And you can just imagine the, the you know, I mean, someone's coming and reading this poem and saying, Oh my God! You're pointing out that the emperor and the empire is actually in in free fall and decline because there's no one who's married a Rajput princess for 150 years. Right. You've got to do something about this. Right. Right. So right. you've actually engaged in an act of again noblesse oblige. Right. Uh, or no, let's say majesty. That's the word. Right. Right. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. And you can just see him pulling his hair. So I right. think that in a sense, this poem. Yeah is an embarrassment. Right. <laughs> um, this poem is one that is still born um, almost from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the author was the only one who was not in on the joke. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's, a, that's a brilliant suggestion. I mean, is that actually, yeah, I hadn't thought of it in those terms. But I think the long context is really important. I mean, uh, it's interesting that in the chronicles that describe the wedding, there's a certain tension attributed to the arrival of the Bharat at the house of the Rajput princess who are, whose, whose wedding party is the Sayyids and the Rajputs insist that everybody who comes to the wedding is going to have to drink um, alcohol or bhang with them. Um, and the, the sort of the, the really orthodox among the marriage procession are offended by this. Um, but this is another unresolved tension, right? And so very much I think this wedding was seen. Um, even in its own context, is a moment of failure, not a moment of shining success. Um, and I think it's absolutely right that, um, you know, he only has about ten lines on the sort of great victory of Islam that this achieves, and for the rest of the time he can only talk about fireworks and illuminations and bomb. So, yeah. But, but you can see how you would not want to go and present this to either Hussein Ali Khan or to the emperor. Right. Um, because it actually manifests their powerlessness the, the fact that power is draining out right, absolutely. of the empire. Right. Uh, and so... Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. This was lovely. I had two tiny comments. Um, the first is just, I'm just very struck by something you just said. That there could be, there could not be something too flattering within the conditions of the panegyrics. I, I was just very struck by that. And it, 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 uh, it's not quite a question. I was trying to imagine, A, wrap my head around the demands of that, as well as to try to fight against it and say, wow. And so I was trying to read Munus's question, you know, as an effective failure of how praise operates. But no, I take it very seriously. I'm just wondering if you could say more. And the other question, it, it, but it's just a, is the more serious one, which is, so if you end, and in response to Nick, take further the sense that even when people are acting in accordance with rules or with a structure or milieu or apparatus of rules, mm -hmm. in precisely that playing with the rules, they change the rules. I mean, this is a Bordeauxian. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, so it's it's um, so that makes me think about if you say more about that about what Bordeaux might have a specific way of thinking about what you're calling contingency and circumstance in a slightly different way. And so, yeah. it's and so if you could say more about I suppose the category of the contingent for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, Bordeaux has been a sort of important person to to touch your second topic first. Uh, Bordeaux has been a sort of important figure, and I think he lurks somewhere beneath this paper, too. Um, uh, I would be very comfortable talking about the habitus of Mughal power, which I 
done in other situations. Um, what's interesting about this particular time is that the system, whatever the system is, whatever the field is, is really transforming beyond recognition very, very rapidly. So in 1707, Aurangzeb dies, a normal imperial succession follows. In 1712, an emperor is dethroned. In 1719, another emperor's body is thrown out in the streets of the city of Delhi. This is a really dramatic moment. Um, and a really overcharged and overdetermined moment. And so it seems my problem then is that I can't really use a static model of cultural change to explain this really dramatic transformation. It would seem to me. So I, I need something that can sort of arrest the free fall, the vertiginous free fall um, of imperial power from between 1712 to 19, right? Um, and so for me, contingency becomes that thing um, because you know, we could ask ourselves some hypotheticals. We could say, what if the Sayyids had in fact been defeated um, and not overthrown the Emperor Baruch What if he'd been able to reassert himself? Well, uh, the story of the empire would look different. Um, this poem would also look different, and it might have been produced perhaps as a poem even successfully. Um, very particular events um, led to these things happening. At the highest level, somebody decided to actually take the emperor out of the harem and kill him. Um, so that was an act that is hard to explain in certain ways. But I think this particular model tries to capture what all sorts of junior subaltern officers of the empire are thinking and doing, right? I mean, they have been steeped in the language of loyalism, they want to do the right thing, yet they find themselves um, in these precarious circumstances. What is it that changes their perfectly orderly and reasonable behavior to produce perverted outcomes. Um, that, that thing, uh, those unintended, unimaginable inflections um, that will later go on to be praised by Adam Smith as the hidden hand, right, for an entirely different order, um, are what I think I call contingency. Shall we adjourn or are there further questions? Yes, Munis, please. So since you want to ask some questions, this is a poem about marriage. Um, yeah. Can you tell us something about how the the, the bride to be uh, or the bride is talked about? I mean you talked about festivals and fireworks. Yeah, she gets about ten lines. I mean because obviously he can't talk about her, right? Okay. Because uh, there's a line, I don't know if I have this. Uh, um, I mean, there, there's a line somewhere or the other. Um, there's a very nice line which basically says that, you know, it mentions her and says she was wrapped up in Ismat and Haya, right? Dar Ismat e Haya Pichida. And that's literally it. Um, and as you know, I mean, this is the other troubling thing about writing about a wedding. You can't actually write about one of the participants in this ritual <laughs> because it would be too dishonorable for the other participant in the ritual. Um, so I'm she is that things have changed by the 18th century. No, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. Basically, your one line is saying you can't write about this yeah, yeah, precisely yeah. because yeah. it's been higher. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes? I have a small quibble. Um, when you were mentioning the praise for, for the uh, Sayyid, mm -hmm. uh, the language that he uses, you characterize it as Shia yeah. uh, terminology. And I'm wondering if that's uh, really accurate for that time period. Mm -hmm. uh, in contemporary Islam, in contemporary Deoban uh, domination, South Asian Islam, it would be immediately tagged as Shia. Yeah. But um, before uh, the 1900s, yeah. it's just very stock praise of somebody who was a Sayyid background, and it's just as valid for a Sunni as, yeah. as a Shia. Well, so, I, I, I regret to say this, uh, but the context um, for this particular poem, in my mind, are the Shia Sunni riots um, of 1709 in Lahore, um, which all revolve around the question of whether Ali gets to be called the Vasi of Muhammad or not, whether he's the inheritor of uh, Muhammad. And when that word is interjected into the khutbah on Friday, right. Right. Um, the khatib gets killed right. and his body gets thrown outside the right. mosque. And so, so there's a sort of large set of riots that happen in Hyderabad, 
and Gujarat and so I mean not to suggest for even a second that anything like our modern relationship or understanding of what is Shia and Sunni applies in any sense to the 18th century other than to say that within this language obviously it is possible to play up in a certain way right um, so it's interesting that when uh, Azad Dilgrami describes the killing of Hussein Ali Khan which he does in his works he uses an explicitly Shia martyrological terminology, right? To describe the killing of people who for other others in the empire would be seen as traitors and disloyal people, right? Um, and this is an interesting move. Why do you need to do that? Um, and I think you need to do that in a sense if you have to justify somebody's actions, um, you need to be able to give them some sort of legitimacy to stand upon, right? Uh, to sort of wipe the taint from their name, which Azad acknowledges cannot be wiped. Um, so it seems to me that it is an interesting feature of this world. Now, Bil Rami himself is, I would not want to say what affiliation he has. I know that he's very strong training in hadith, right? So he clearly comes from a sort of very orthopraxic background. Um, and yet he can use this language, and he is using it in a very particular context, in a trouble drain. So I don't want to completely let go of the idea that there is a tension here between Shi and Sunni that has been mobilized to productively. Hannah. Um, just to kind of continue with the questions about the language of the poem, um, what do you think explains the, the section you mentioned where there's the tensions um, regarding um, the guests being asked to drink alcohol and to participate in the taking ball and whatnot? Like, why include that in a Right, so that's not in the poem, right? The section on alcohol is in Chronicles, it's not in the poem itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, this is probably not a single continuous, meaningful, sensible work until Azar Bil Rami puts it together in 1731, right? And you can tell that by its sort of sectional nature, so I should have perhaps made that more clear at the beginning of my talk, but. Um, yeah. So, um, Thank you for Jewel the talk. Thank you. Uh, oh. Please join us for the session. Thank you.